Okay, well, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Chris Deeran. I'm the director of Reform Scotland. Uh, delighted you could make it along for today's quite timely event. Could I just ask uh, anyone who isn't me or one of today's two panelists to mute themselves, please, just to avoid any unnecessary background noise? Be very helpful. Thanks very much. Um, so I suppose the first thing to say is that we're all still reeling a bit from the surprise resignation last week of Nicola Sturgeon. Um, she was the dominant figure in Scottish politics uh, and a huge figure across British politics for the past eight years since she became First Minister. Uh, and suddenly uh, we're having to think about the country without her at its helm. Uh, and it's a moment of significant change for Scotland in one way or another, maybe in a few ways. The country will soon be led uh, by someone new they will have their own views, their own priorities, uh, and it seems they will be from a, a new generation. We've currently got three candidates declared, Hamza Youssef, the Health Secretary, Kate Forbes, the Economy Secretary, and Ash Regan, who was a minister and resigned over the uh, gender reforms. I think we should know the result by either late March or early April. Is that right to either of you? 27th of March, I think. Yeah. 27th yeah. of March, right, OK. Um, so I suppose today there's there's a, a fair amount to discuss. Uh, one of them is what do we make of the past eight years under the outgoing First Minister, her successes, her failures, how she changed Scotland, what the missed opportunities might have been, uh, and what will this new era look like? What should it look like? Should the SNP con continue down the path laid by Nicola Sturgeon, or should it change direction? Should it veer off? Should it adjust slightly? Uh, I would argue, and have argued uh, in my writing for a while, that she focused on progressive issues that were largely about trying to help the vulnerable in society, which I don't think at all is a bad thing. But possibly this was to the exclusion of tackling some of the more major mainstream reforms that Scotland needs to its education system, its health service and its economy. So one of the questions is, will a new leader address these issues? And if so, how? Uh, is it even possible to renew after 16 years in government? You could point to the fact that neither the Tories nor Labour managed it in the 80s and the noughties after Thatcher and Blair finally departed after their long prime ministerships. It's not an easy thing to do. On independence, uh, obviously very important to the SNP and a huge topic of debate in Scotland at large. I think Nicola Sturgeon's approach to securing it seemed to me certainly to become almost more frenetic and insistent, even at times desperate as time passed. Um, there were new papers and new strategies and new dates set. We were off to the Supreme Court. But of course, nothing came of it by the time uh, she decided to leave office. So again, Will the new leader and First Minister take a different tack on this issue? And if so, what should that be? Um, should the SNP, for example, rediscover its famed strategic patience, which is, after all, what took it from three MPs in the early 90s to its current heights, both at Holyrood and at Westminster? And of course, there is a big question, who is the best of the available candidates now running to lead the SNP and, more importantly, our country? Uh, we'll all have our own views on that. Uh, probably quite strong views, but this is a decision that will be taken by SNP members. And today we're very lucky to have with us two of the SNP's brightest and best elected members. Um, we have Joanna Kerry. Joanna Kerry. Joanna, John, John Kerry. We have Joanna <laughs> Kerry, King's Council, MP for Edinburgh South West and a former SNP justice spokesperson. Um, Joanna was probably, fair to say, one of the more outspoken critics of the way that Nicholas Sturgeon ran the party and the devolved government. And she says that the upcoming leadership contest must show a frank recognition of the shortcomings of the SNP at party and government level. Uh, Joanna was, of course, a leading voice against the proposed gender reform bill. Stuart MacDonald is MP for Glasgow South and a former SNP defence spokesperson, both former, you'll note. Uh, he has described himself as the loyalist's loyalist um, and supported the gender reforms, but, but he nevertheless published a pamphlet shortly before the First Minister's resignation arguing against her plan for the next general election to be a de facto referendum. And he says that her replacement cannot simply offer more of the same, they must also represent a generational change and an evolution in political thought. So welcome to you both today and thanks so much for taking the time to be with us at what must be a pretty busy moment uh, for you guys and your, your party. Um, before we talk about the future, I, I think I'd probably like to start by looking back at the last eight years and maybe get an overview from the both from you both about what it all 
amounted to? How will we look back on Sturgeon's time in office? What monuments does she leave behind her? What might she have done better? Um, Joanna, would you like to start for us? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's beyond doubt that Nicola Sturgeon is a great campaigner and a great communicator and that she was very good at mastering a brief. And I know from speaking to constituents and friends that a lot of people hugely appreciated the calmness and clarity of her press briefings during the COVID crisis. And I think that'd be one of the things she's most remembered for. Also, looking back to what you said in your introductory remarks, Chris, I think Nicola has been very good at redistributing wealth with measures such as the child poverty payment and also mitigation of the bedroom tax. But I think she's left behind her some major policy headaches for her successor, although I'm very much of the view that those headaches are not for one person. They must be approached by a more team-based and collegiate approach in the party. But those headaches include the gender recognition reform bill, although I really hope that the leadership campaign is going to get off identity politics and onto the big issues soon. But they do include that. Um, they include the educational attainment gap, problems in the NHS, uh, the inadequate proposals to deal with the social care crisis, an energy policy that's not been properly thought through, uh, the deposit return scheme, you know, I'm blue in the face listening to businesses in my constituency tell me what a disaster it is from the small to the large, the ferry fiasco, the failure to duel the A9, it could go on and on. Like, you know, as you said, lots of governments look stale after this amount of time in, in power. But because of the constitutional divide, it's perfectly likely that the SNP will remain in power for a few years going forward. And we need a, a major reset. And, and I would stress that although the raison d'etre of the SNP is independence, it's also in our constitution that we have to further uh, the good governance and the interests of Scotland. And um, one of the reasons we nearly won the 2014 referendum was because at that time people perceived us as a very effective government. I don't think that's any longer the case and I think the new leader needs to address that. And then finally on, on our raison d'etre, I think Nicola will be remembered for reversing the vehicle of independence up a blind alley and then leaving it without a driver. She spent many years telling anyone who would listen that the only way for Scotland to become independent was as a result of a referendum underpinned by a Section 30 order, and that was the gold standard. That is now very firmly embedded in the minds, not just of people in the United Kingdom, but perhaps more importantly, foreign governments in the European Union. And then she tried to jump ship to test the legal case for Holyrood holding a referendum and a de facto referendum without ever having allowed any proper policy discussion of it in the party. Now, people like myself had been advocating for years that we should think about taking a bill through Holyrood and then testing the competence. I never said we should go to the Supreme Court to ask for their opinion. And I do think any First Minister who seriously had that as their policy plank could have appointed a law officer who thought the bill was competent, just as a law officer was appointed who thought the GRR was competent. And now there's big question marks over its uh, human rights compliance and its, uh, how it sits with the Equality Act. And then on the issue of the de facto referendum, uh, you know, I... I think we should have left open the argument that if we didn't get a Section 30 order, we would use a general election as a mandate to negotiate for independence. But that argument was kind of closed down and it was opened up again in a very cat handed fashion. And again, people in the party had wanted a debate about this at the conference in October 2019. They were booed off the stage. So <clears throat> I think um, there are, you know, it'd be very hard to fill Nicola's shoes. She is an amazing politician, but she's left her party with a headache on our main reason for existence and with many policy headaches. And uh, it's not going to be a, an easy task for uh, the new first minister and the new cabinet she or he appoints. OK, Stuart. Well, look, look there's, there's bits of that I definitely agree with. Um, uh, to, to do the hagiography at the beginning, uh, if I might, you know, I share a constituency with the First Minister. I've known her well for a long time, uh, and she has only ever been extremely supportive of me personally and politically. And I think, you know, to pick up where Joanna ended, enormous shoes to fill. I mean, that, that's become a cliche, I accept, but it's nonetheless true. You know, she absolutely had 
that magic touch when it comes to connecting with voters, even voters who may not necessarily like the SNP or agree with our policy platform or like the idea of independence, she inspired a level of confidence that, that perhaps reached beyond the party. Uh, and that's special. I don't think you can learn that. I think you can learn it up to a point. Um, but I've seen her, you know, just as comfortable walking into houses in Castle Milk in my constituency as she is standing at that pandemic podium displaying a command of her brief in serious times. So a bar has been set for the new leader that you have to be able to do both of those things. You have to be able to have the magic touch on the streets, uh, but equally the country has to have confidence in you when the next pandemic or the next crisis comes, as it inevitably will. Um, so what are the successes and the failures? You know, rightly, Joanna mentions things like uh, Social Security Scotland, the child payment and other redistributive measures. You know, and, and these can't just be glossed over. These have made massive, massive impacts on people's lives. I see it in my own constituency, uh, and I'm sure every elected member does. But undoubtedly, there are there are big challenges. Uh, there are big challenges for every single capital city in Europe right now. Uh, but our domestic challenges that are are unique to us. I want to hear some serious solutions from the leadership candidates. And I suspect we'll get into a, a bit of what that might look like. But kind of stepping back slightly, you know, I, I've written this in my uh, in my my column at the weekend. I think the a winning platform for me to move on. I mean, this is the proper sunset on the Salmon Sturgeon era of 20 years. So what's the next generation? What's the next era? What does it look and sound like? And what is its connection with the public? And what, what the duo back in 2004 understood was the need for the party to be almost kind of grabbed with the scruff of the neck, given a modernizing upgrade and polish, instill a sense of discipline around a message that connects with the public in order to get into government and get a referendum. It's that level of upgrade I think we need now in 2023, but it's tougher. And it's tougher because we've got a record to defend, we've got a record behind us, and it's always tough to try and renew when you're in office. But also that attempt at renewal is coming arguably at the worst possible time in terms of things like inflation, the cost of living crisis, a war in Europe, and all of the effects that these things have. Scotland is not immune to these things. So I really hope, as Joanna correctly says, we can get off uh, of social issues. They are massively important. They're important to me. But I think the danger we have is we end up having a debate with ourselves. We end up essentially looking at what the Tories have done in the past, looking at what Labour have done in the past, and thought, ah, right, we'll have a bit of that. This needs to be a conversation with the country. Uh, and I think that means a platform that grapples with the big issues has a serious plan for government and a convincing plan to move us forward on independence. If you can get those two things right, uh, I think everything else becomes noise. When uh, <clears throat> the First Minister made her resignation speech, it was a long speech. Uh, it was quite a broad speech. She gave quite a diverse range of reasons behind why she decided to stand down then. Um, she felt she could no longer give the job everything that it needed. But uh, as you said, Joanna, you know, she was leaving some untied threads behind her. She was in trouble over a de facto referendum plan. The gender reforms had run into the ground, faced a battle with the Supreme Court, which could have gone either way. And she didn't resolve either before resigning. And also, I guess, as a result of that, her personal popularity had dropped a bit, as had the party's support and support for the independence cause. So I just wonder what your view is about why now? Why did she go when she did rather than hang on till the general election? Is it simply that she ran out of puff or is there a slight sense that it was all getting a bit much and she's run away? Now, that's maybe a harsh way to put it, but um, it was just the, you know, the timing, the suddenness, the, the, you know, the lack of a kind of proper end point at which she decided to go. What's your view of that, Joanna? Well, look, I'm not going to criticise somebody who's given eight years of public service. It's no secret that Nicola and I are not on the same page about a number of issues, but I don't know the reasons for her resignation. There's a lot of speculation, um, and I'm not really going to indulge in that just now. 
but I did take most of us by surprise. It's perhaps a reflection that it wasn't as much of a surprise as it might have been a few months ago, but nevertheless, it did take us by surprise, particularly coming during the middle of, of recess when so many people were out of the country, including people who might have wanted to decide whether they were going to run for leader or not in what appears to be an incredibly truncated timetable. And I don't understand why the timetable has to be so truncated. We've got a first minister, she could remain in place and maybe try and address some of these issues while we have a proper leadership election. We've not had one for 20 years. Our constitution states that they normally take a good bit longer than this. I hope that HQ are going to organise some hustings, not just for the party, but for the public to see, because this person is going to become leader of the SNP and then the first minister. And I think the public have a right to see what they have to offer. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, I, I, clearly one of the one of the factors in her resignation is what's happened since the GRR bill was passed in December. And I've said this, I wrote this in my newspaper column last week. The process of the gender recognition bill and the process of how gender recognition re reform was taken in our party is a microcosm of everything that's wrong with Nicola Sturgeon's leadership. This policy was never properly thought through. It wasn't debated at our conference ever. Our conference never supported self-ID. Uh, those of us who had reasoned objections were rubbished and demonised. Dissenters were demonised and we didn't take the public with us. And I mean, you know, that's a microcosm for what's gone wrong. Uh, whoever becomes the leader needs to reinstitute the internal democracy of the party. You know, I've been going to SNP meetings with my father since I was a wee girl in the 1970s. And I know that the SNP has in the past, give or take the blip with the 79 group and being chucked out of the party, but we've managed to have some really measured debates about some very difficult issues. Eventually the tension between fundamentalism and gradualism was solved by ALEC by a reasoned debate. We had the debate about NATO. That was a reasonable debate. We stopped having reasonable debates. And it, you know we have the we always had a tradition in our party where people were allowed a conscience vote. We've had the spectacle of senior parliamentarians and cabinet secretaries calling for people like myself who disagree with a policy that was never uh, approved by conference and wasn't in our manifesto, calling for us to, to leave the party. Now, we have to grow up and get away from that. You know, we're supposed to be uh, persuading people who are as yet unpersuaded of the cause of independence, the soft nose. We're not going to do that by quashing debate and demonizing people who dare to disagree within our own party. And I don't think people should underestimate the scale of the problem that we have there. And I'm not talking about myself, but just think about this. If a middle-class privileged professional woman who's a member of parliament like myself cannot raise issues about policy, the gender recognition bill, without being sacked from her position and receiving constant abuse and threats from within the party, then what hope does a vulnerable or working class woman have when she raises concerns about self-ID for her dignity, safety and privacy? If I can't do it in my privileged position in safety, then how could working class women or vulnerable women, old ladies who want their care delivered uh, by other women, et cetera. So I think we need a major reset there. And uh, I think all of the candidates need to be big enough to address what's gone wrong. But I stress, we do need to, after that to get off identity politics. There are massive issues facing the country and facing people, you know, I see it with my constituents who really people in massive financial difficulty, partly as a result, Liz Truss has cock up, but also because of the war, and because of Brexit, we need to address these issues and we need to address them in a much more thoughtful way. You know, a party of independence, that is the governing party under devolution, should have a policy programme, a bit like Roosevelt's New Deal, that spans, say, one decade, two decades or 15 years, whereby you go to the country and you say, this is what we want to do. This is our vision for Scotland. Here's what we can do under devolution. And here's what we would do if you vote for independence. But one of the reasons that the Scottish government has been so prone to policy capture, as I believe happened with named person and with the GRR bill, is it's not had a properly thought through policy program. And so it's been very vulnerable to people bringing what looked like vote winning or progressive ideas and turn out to be rather rather the opposite. And, and I don't want to stay on the gender issue for any longer than than really now but obviously we, we have to address it and Stuart you were on the other side I guess of, of, of the debate do you do you yeah. think now that it, 
would probably have been better if it had been handled differently in terms of having success if, if some of those on the other side had felt they were more listened to, if there had been maybe more discussion about what was in the bill, if some of the amendments had, had been taken. And, and if you could address that, and also what do you think the new leader, whoever they are, should do about it? Should they continue to the Supreme Court? Should they take it back to the Parliament and reform it? Should they drop it? What, what would your take on those two things be? So, yeah, I think the fact that we're in this torture position suggests that it could have been handled better. There's no question of that. Um, uh, and although Joanna and myself would agree on that, it may be the case that we have differing views on how, how that would be, but nobody's enjoying this. Um, and from a from a nakedly political point of view, all it does is is empower and benefit our opponents. So there's there's nothing about this uh, that's good. In terms of the challenge to it, um, I'm of the view that the parliament voted for the legislation, and any incoming SNP leader needs to defend the will of parliament. Uh, that being said. Uh, it's and I would defer to Joanna in aspects of this as a KC. Um, if the Scottish government is not convinced, if the legal advice or, or, or when the legal advice comes into contact with politics and the Scottish government is not convinced that it would win that case, it needs a better avenue forward. Now, I support the bill, uh, I support the principle of self ID. Uh, I, I, I think it's, um, I think, it, I think it is a mark of progress in the broader journey that Scotland has had over the period of, of devolution. But we're kind of stuck in this holding pattern um, that I don't think benefits anyone. And I think what we need to hear from the leadership candidates is a way to breach that. So if it's a challenge in the Supreme Court, which I am initially attracted to having not seen any of the legal advice and not being a legal expert, outline that to the party and to the country. If there's another better way to do it, but we still get the reforms that I believe are needed and that people expect, then let's hear what that is as well. But if I could just come back to a couple of other things, Chris. I mean, you said you said at the start that she gave a long resignation speech, and I say this from a place of love. It, it will never be as long as an Ian Blackford speech, so there's always <laughs> that. Um, and I say that as a, I love Ian, Ian Blackford dearly. Um, but I think there's a there's definitely an opportunity here for a culture of reset. Uh, sorry, a, a reset of the culture, uh, not just around debate, but about the institutions and the checks and the balances that the different parts of the mechanics of the party are meant to have, whether that's around things like the NEC, whether it's around the position of deputy leader. Uh, I will vote for a candidate who wants to bring back and fully empower National Council. That will mean little to the majority of the people on this call, but the people who know will know why I say that. And I think that the, you know, rightly has uh, the NATO debate and other big uh, issues have been referenced. We are at that point, and I think some people have still to catch up with what's actually happened here. You know, I, I watched for a couple of days after Nicola Sturgeon gave her resignation speech, people still trying to grasp onto the idea that we can have this special conference and decide the independent strategy, and it was somehow separate to the leadership uh, going. This isn't just the end of uh, Nicola Sturgeon's first ministership. This, is a, this has to be, and we should not be frightened to embrace the opportunity for a massive shift and hopefully a positive shift in how the party does business, how it approaches government, and how it seeks to convince the country that independence delivers a good future. And I'm attracted to, I like big thinking. I think you know me well enough to know that, Chris. I want a candidate to come out with a kind of Scotland 2050 vision uh, and empower a team of people around them, whether they're ministers, ministers and other party figures in order to drive that case forward to the country, because I, I'm wholly convinced that the way you move the dial on independence, even in a country as polarised as Scotland has become around the constitution, is around performance of the Scottish government and people having a feeling that um, the government has got people's backs, that public services are delivering well, that the government is doing everything it possibly can, not just to mitigate the worst of what comes from the government here in Westminster, but actually has a plan to, to realize people's aspirations. If you couple that with a, an economic case for independence that's about fairness, that's about a, a, a more equal economy, that's about raising living standards in line with our Western European counterparts, 
uh, that's about delivering a better public realm and all of those things. I think that's I think that's the magic sauce right there. Uh, so I want big thinking. I want collaboration. I want a reset in terms of how we do uh, some of the business in the party. You know, Joanna mentions the whole thing about de facto referendum, and there was a desire to debate this a few years ago. Um, I, I, I and she's heard me say this. I, I was against having that debate because I thought it was a mad idea. I now wish we'd had it, if only to kill it four years ago. <laughs> to be bluntly honest. But we are where we are. So I think we've got a chance now for the candidates to set out their stall. We can actually test the mood of the party, which is something that is often assumed by people uh, and, and, and not all that well informed sometimes, uh, and see exactly what the party is willing to get behind. And it's really important that that is what happens. Whoever wins, whether it's the candidate we like, the candidate we don't like, the SNP is at its best when it's united and disciplined. And we've lost that over the past few years and we need to get it back. Can I just come in on something, Chris, sure. about the legal action? And I know we need to get off the GRR and off onto other issues, but it's not just about this. The Scottish government needs to stop picking court fights with the British government that it can't win. It's a pointless exercise. You know, we've had, a, you know, the case on the rights of the child, I don't know why we thought that. We'd clearly strayed in some respects out of devolved competence. Um, I, you know, I regret very much the way that um, the Scottish government went cap in hand to the Supreme Court asking for permission to do something. You know, I don't like the idea that you go and ask something, you take a position and then you test it. That's what lawyers are for. But anyway, that's done and dusted now. But on this Section 35 order, um, you know, read the room, look at the opinion polls. The public don't want us to waste more money on a challenge to this. And I, you know, I've got, I hold no candle for um, the Conservatives uh, using this for the first time. But frankly, I'm embarrassed that we gave them the opportunity to do that. Over the last few years, a small but doughty band of mainly women, people like Murray Blackburn Mackenzie, have repeatedly told MSPs that there were problems with this bill in relation to the Equality Act. The human rights analysis of the bill in Parliament was nothing short of appalling. I chair the Human Rights Committee down here. When we look at government legislation, we don't just look at the rights of the people it's entitled, it's designed to assist. We also look at the unintended consequences for other people's rights. You'll search in vain for that kind of human rights analysis uh, during the passage of the bill. And as Shona Craven from The Nationalist said, yes, we had six years of debate about this, but don't, uh, don't uh, confuse um, the, qu the quantity of the debate with the quality of the debate. Now, I was at a seminar this morning uh, down here at Westminster about the retained EU law bill, which is going just about to go through the Lords. And uh, people in the Lords were asking me what I thought would happen to their amendments in the Commons. And I said, you won't succeed because we're in a crisis of democracy in Britain at the moment, both in Westminster and London, where people just vote like lemmings when they're whipped to do so. And very few people have the courage to stand up and look at the bigger picture or to do their jobs properly as legislators. And I don't think the Scottish Parliament did its job properly as legislators in the GRR. Um, <clears throat> and here's another thing. Even if by some miracle the Scottish government won the case on the Section 35 order, and remember the British government only have to show that they exercised the power reasonably, the bill would then be open to a human rights challenge. I'd be absolutely astonished if there wasn't a human rights challenge on behalf of for the impact on, on women's rights and also LGB rights. So I think um, whoever becomes leader will have to eat the humble pie on this that Nicola refused to eat and uh, move us on from it. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have reform of the Gender Recognition Act, I think we should. And uh, when this all started really kicking off, when I first stuck my head above the parapet on this issue and started to uh, suffer as a result of it, I, I, one of my constituents who's a trans woman came to see me at my surgery. And initially I thought we were going to disagree very strongly, but once we had a civilized conversation, we realized that we were quite close in our views about matters. And we wrote a joint letter to the Scottish government suggesting a citizens assembly mm -hmm. um, on this issue. And if if I was running for the leadership of the party, that's what I would be suggesting. Um, and uh, yeah, an and, and you know, this, and, yeah. and also you see, um, that would also fulfil our manifesto promises on reform, which have not as yet been fulfilled. 
Okay. Um, now, just to say before I move on to my next question, I, I'm going to try and get through as many audience questions as possible. I'm more likely to take the ones that are looking forward that are about the leadership contest and where we go next. I don't want to talk about the gender reform thing, which we've talked about exhaustively for the last couple of years. Um, if I never write the words gender reform again, I'd be quite happy, to be honest. Um, so we've got the contest underway. Um, Kate Forbes, who I have been a big fan of, uh, I think she is uh, a, a generational talent in many ways. Uh, I think she is has a great policy brain. I think she's got a great curiosity. I think her personality is fantastic. I think she had real leadership skills. Um, but there you go, it shows what I know. Her campaign seems to have, uh, the engine has blown up in the starting line, uh, if, you, if you believe social media anyway. Um, her comments on gay marriage have cost her the support of a number of declared backers. I suspect the membership won't like what she said very much. Um, but her views were hardly unknown. Uh, I remember interviewing her a couple of years ago for the New States when we went over all this. Um, she may not have expressed herself in the way that people would have wanted, but you know, she said what she, she thinks. I mean, you, you are a gay man and a lesbian who are known for campaigning for gay and lesbian rights. Um, what do you make of it all? Uh, Stuart, do you want to go first on this one? So I, when I saw what Kate had to say yesterday and the kind of subsequent reaction to it. Um, I was in part a bit surprised by the reaction because as you rightly say, Chris, we've not learned anything new. We all knew what Kate's views on these issues were beforehand. Um, and without divulging the content of a conversation, you know, I had a phone call with Kate at the weekend where we talked through some of this stuff. I like Kate a lot. I've got enormous uh, respect for her. I, I'm glad she's on our team and not in, in any other political party fighting us. Uh, and I think we need to make the most of her. And, and part of this discussion that I had with her was not around her views, which I've got no objection to her holding, holding the views that she holds. Absolutely no objection whatsoever. Uh, but it's all around how, one, that would how would that what would the relationship be between those views and her government and how she governs as the head of government and also how does she package that how does she package that and sell that to the to the country and in particular to the lgbt community and and the thing that people were worried about a lot of people were saying to me over the past few days oh she's going to get the tim farron treatment she's going to get asked as gay sex a sin and and I, I didn't think it would be the gay marriage thing that would cause the storm that it's caused. I mean, she was asked the, the gay sex sin question <laughs> and she gave the only right answer that there is, which is what consenting adults do in their own homes is absolutely nothing to do with me. And that's the answer I would give. And I'm, I'm glad it's the answer she has given. But on the on the marriage thing, so there's, I completely disagree with her on this. And the, I remember the equal marriage campaign. I remember, I remember one of our parliamentarians organizing an anti-equal marriage campaign at a, a previous SNP conference that I organized a picket uh, outside. So I, you know, I, I'm strongly committed to equal marriage and other parts of, of LGBT rights. But there's, Kate has said an important thing. And it's getting lost in the sauce. And for some people, this will never be enough, and that's fine. And she has said not only that she won't be rolling anything back, but she's gone a step further, and the step further is important. And that is that she will defend the rights, the minority rights, that the parliament has bestowed upon LGBT people in Scotland. Now, that is important. Uh, and I suspect that's a big thing for her to say as well. But I know Kate, I know she's a decent person. I won't pretend to know her enormously well. And I think had she had she presented this slightly differently and thought a bit more about what are people actually worried about here and how can I speak to those concerns, this probably could have been handled better. And I think that, for example, if you look at what's going on with... Uh, hate crime in this country towards the LGBT community. If you look at what's going on more broadly around Europe, where LGBT people are being used as a as a kind of you know weapon in the culture war to 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 try and shore up the base, usually by parties on the right. If she had come out and said, "I understand that you're worried about that, and I reject entirely that way of doing politics. I want to be your first minister as well." 
And I want to hear about the things that matter to you and matter, you know, matter a lot to the LGBT community. So if she'd come out, for example, with a, a statement that said hate crime in Scotland against LGBT people is shamefully high and my government will drive that down and here's how I intend to do it. If she can speak to those broader concerns, and by the way, and I'm sure Johanna will back me up here, we're also worried about other stuff, house prices, getting jobs, mental health support, um, other public services, we care about other things as well. So she can, if she could have come out and speak to those anxieties and also her aspirations on a level that I don't think does compromise her faith. And I said to her on Saturday, never say anything that you don't believe in, never lie, but equally you cannot sound as though your mouth is full of marbles. And I think there's still room for her to shape this Will it ultimately help her get to winning? I think we need to wait and see. Do you, but, do you think but like you, you can... said, we need to get on to the big issues that the country care about. This was a bill that passed more than 10 years ago when Kate Forbes was uh, probably still a student. But I also accept entirely and believe myself, it's still an important marker what she thinks of that. Could you still vote for her, Stuart? I don't know. Okay, Joanna, what, what would your take on things be? Well, <clears throat> I think we've got a huge diversity of faith in Scotland. Uh, you know, we've got Christian within that, we've got Protestant, Catholic, we've got Muslim, we've got Jewish, we've got Hindu, forgive me if I've left anyone out. And we've also got people of no faith. And, and I think by and large, we rub along reasonably well. I think there are still some issues of, of sectarianism. Um, but people tend not to bring their faith into work or public life, it's a, it's a private matter, although we've always had a tradition of a conscience vote in the SNP, for example, quite a significant percentage of Stuart and my colleagues at Westminster in the Westminster group are devout Catholics, and I have no objection with them taking a conscience vote on abortion, um, although my views would differ from them. Um, you could argue that it's unfair that Kate's been targeted in the way that she has, but by the same token, I think the answers she's given have been very unpolitical and I'm surprised at how they've been formed. And I'm not asking for her to be dishonest. And I noticed in the chat, somebody said, we all knew her views, why all the pearl clutching? I agree with that. People knew where Kate's views were and the people who supported her, I can't quite understand why they've chucked her overboard quite so quickly when they must have known her views. And mm -hmm. she's undoubtedly a, a politician of calibre. And one of the things that attracted me to her, although I'm supporting Ash Regan, but one of the things that attracted me to both of them is that they have a hinterland outside politics. I don't really want to have a first minister who's never had a job outside politics. Um, and I think the party over recent years, um, I hear this from businesses all the time, both small businesses in my constituency and bigger businesses, the part, they feel that uh, the part, business doesn't have the ear of the party any longer. And we saw... Uh, many businesses during the COVID crisis who felt that the government was taking decisions without really consulting them properly, which had massive impacts on their businesses. So that's why I was, Kate was my second choice. Uh, and um, a bit like Stuart, I'll need to wait and see uh, how uh, matters evolve. But I do think that perhaps Hamza should be grilled on some of his previous positions and his abstention on equal marriage and his reasons for it. Um, and I note that Ian Blackford's a member of the same church as Kate. It was never suggested that in any way he wasn't suitable to be member leader of the Westminster group for that reason. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's been a bit of a car crash for Kate over the last 24 hours. And from what I'm reading on Twitter, it's got worse rather than better today. And I think it's really unfortunate. But I just, I just want to say something about the generational shift. We talked a minute ago about generational shift. I do think someone who's 32 is perhaps a bit young to be first minister. I'd like to, generally to see somebody with a bit more life experience. And what I want to see in the SNP is not a generational shift, but a shift away from a close uh, grouping of people who've run the party for the last 20 years. Many of the members who've joined since the referendum or members like myself who were around before the referendum, but didn't become particularly active till the referendum. You know, we've got a voice in the future of, of the party too. Um, but, uh, you know, I think... Well, well, can I, can I inter interrupt there, Joanna, because yeah. um, talking about stepping away from the, the group that have been running the party, 
Hamza Yusuf, I guess, would now be counted the, the, the favourite. Um, he seems to be running as something of a continuity candidate, or maybe that's a bit harsh. Um, the party machine certainly seems to be supporting him. There are persistent rumours that John Swinney will come out and, and publicly endorse him. Um, I mean, had, you know, he's held some government jobs. I, I, I struggle to look at his track record and say that he has been outstanding in any of those jobs, the hate crime bill, which he put through as justice minister, still hasn't been enacted. Um, I'm not sure his handling of the NHS over the winter crisis that we've had has filled the population full of, of confidence. Maybe that's unfair. Um, but, 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 you know, Hamza at the moment can just sit back and, and let the Kate story unfold uh, uh, and, and, and almost just let, let himself run ahead. Neither of you have come out and said it should be Hamza. So what's your view of the Hamza Yusuf candidacy, uh, Joanna? And if you could keep your answer relatively short. Mm. I think those. he's a continuity candidate. I think the party needs a massive reset. The party needs to acknowledge where we've gone wrong. And the party badly needs an infusion of new advisors and, and spads who have more experience in the world of business and other aspects rather than people who've just been made a spad because they're a time served staffer. And I'm afraid if Hamza becomes leader, it'll just be more of the same and we need a big reset. Um, also, I have severe reservations about the way that Hamza handled the hate crime bill. I think the fact that it's not enforced so many months or years down the line tells you something about it. I can tell you as a lawyer, I'm firmly of the view that if it ever does come into force, huge aspects of it will not survive a human rights challenge. Um, Hamza worked for some months and spoke to me behind the scenes about amendments to that act, to that bill, which were designed to protect freedom of speech. And the morning I tweeted in support of those government amendments was the start of the end of my front bench career. And I was wrongly branded a transphobe for supporting government amendments to protect free speech. And of course, I was a backed down and I was thrown under the bus and the rest is history. But I wasn't impressed at all with the way he conducted himself in relation to the hate crime bill. I passionately care that legislation in Scotland is good legislation and complies with our international obligations under the European Convention on Human Rights. I have no doubt that that bill doesn't. It's appalling legislation. And uh, so um, if that's an example of Hamza's track record, it does not endear me to him. Uh, clearly, he has skills as a communicator, um, but we need a bit more than that. And I'll be corrected if I'm wrong. I don't think Hamza has ever had a job outside politics. I'd like to see a leader of my party and my country who has a bit of a hinterland out with politics. And very quickly before I go on to Stuart, you're supporting Ash Regan. Um, she's probably the least well known. In fact, until she resigned from the government, you know, she had well, you know, she was probably even less well known. What is it that she has? And it would be an awful leap from what she's mm -hmm. done to be first minister, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, um, one of the things you might notice about Ash is it's widely commented on by all sorts of people who are not necessarily natural SNP sympathisers that she was a very good minister. For example, my colleague Roddy Dunlop, the Dean of the Faculty of Advocates, has said that. Um, the reason I'm supporting Ash is that she's more on the left of the party. She's more in tune with my views on policy direction. Uh, I like the fact that she's worked on policy development with Commonweal. I don't agree with all their ideas, but for a long time, their door of the SNP has been shut in their face, and I'd like to see it opened again. Um, I also think Ash showed it, it, real courage and integrity and leadership when she resigned her ministerial position before Christmas, and that attracts me towards her. I also very much liked her statement. I mean, she's not had her campaign launch yet. That'll be later this week. But her opening statement... Uh, when she said she wanted government to be more of a team effort and then that she would set up an, independ an independence convention and try and bring the movement back together, look at how we go forward, and also has expressed an interest in really addressing some of the policy challenges that the SNP government currently has. So I'll be giving Ash my first preference with um, some enthusiasm. Uh, it's, a, it's a single transferable vote uh, system in the SNP, uh, so the second preference will be quite important. But really, if there's anybody on who has any power at the top of the SNP, and I know that's a very small group, we absolutely have to have hustings. It is unconscionable to think that this election that's already happening in far too short a period should take place without hustings that are public and televised. OK. And Stuart, um, your views on Hamza Yusuf and Ash Regan? Yeah, so I mean, on the last point, my understanding is we will have hustings. I don't, I don't think that the, they would get away with not having them. Um, 
And it's really important we can get under the skin of the plans that each candidate has. Um, and I said, you know, you asked me, could I vote for Kate? And I said, I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying no, right? Uh, equally, I'm not saying no to Hamza. Uh, I won't be, even with your considerable charm, Chris, bounced into deciding live on, on this session. I want to know what their plans are. And I think the successful pitch is, is the, built around the twin pillars of good government and a convincing, credible plan to secure independence. Those are the two things that matter to me. I believe they matter to members. I believe that's what our voters and the country at large will expect. I've known Hamza a long time. I've known him the entire time that I'm in the party. Um, he's a good guy. Uh, I would count him as a friend. I need to know a bit more about what his vision is. I, I need to hear from him. Uh, what he plans to do around the independence question. I need to hear what he plans to do around the economy. I need to hear what he plans to do around climate change. Uh, I want to hear what he's going to do about the fact that Labour's tails are up and we've got a very obvious political challenge there. Uh, and I want to hear that from everybody, right? I want to hear that from Kate as well. And I want to hear that from Ash. And um, for me, I don't know Ash. I don't think I've ever had a conversation with her. Um, the plan that she has outlined for independence immediately, in my view, doesn't work. So I, 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 it would take a lot for me, given the paper I just published about three weeks ago, to do a big U-turn on that one. And I think the only thing most people um, know about her is that she resigned from government uh, over GRA. To some people, that will be a, a sign of courage. To others, it, it wouldn't mean... It wouldn't mean much, um, but I, I, I really, I really want to get away from the the, the personalities in this. You know, let's get on to the policy discussion. I can even see in the in the comments of the of the chat to this um, event here. That's where people want to get, and it's inevitable that personality becomes wrapped up on in all of this, because it's the twenty first century and it's it's how politics is done. But far more better far more better to interrogate their ideas around improving Scotland, improving the Scottish National Party, and crucially, moving the dial on independence. If you can do all of that, I think you've got a winning pitch and you'll you'll nail it. And do you think, Stuart, that the um, on the economy, for example, I remember speaking to Nicola Sturgeon probably quite early in her first ministership, and even then business was starting to complain that it felt it wasn't being listened to. And I said to her, I'm hearing this constantly when I'm in the business community speaking to people. And she said, well, you know, their voice has been heard loud and clear for a long time in Scotland. And I think it's now time for other voices to be mm. to be heard. And maybe what we saw then was 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 that happening. But, you know, it doesn't have to be either or. It can be both. Um, so I wonder on, on the economy side of things, how you see, how much of a priority does that have to be for the next First Minister? Because we have issues, deep issues with economic growth. We have issues with businesses getting investment. We have issues with businesses yep. starting up and, and continuing. Um, you know, we have some issues where people complain about the tax system, although that, you know, that's a, a different argument. Um, so how, how important is the economy, which hasn't felt, it seemed to be much more important to Alex Salmond as a, an issue than it, than it did to Nicola Sturgeon. Do you think that needs to change going into the new leadership? It, it, economy is the only show in town. It is the only show in town. Uh, and so you need to have a government that, that looks and sounds as though it gets that. Uh, and that means I can even see some messages in the sidebar here, looking at the planning system, looking at the taxation system, all of these things. But it also means, Chris, you know, I mentioned some of the big uh, geopolitical events that are taking place right now. None of this is immaterial to Scotland, whether that's climate change, the war in Ukraine, whether that's the big powers like the European Union and the United States looking to uh, develop resilience in their supply chains. Uh, the US has got the CHIPS Act. Uh, the European Union is looking at new creative ways to respond to the US's Inflation Reduction Act and what it's doing around green subsidies. And Brexit Britain is caught in the middle with few cards to play. So Scotland and Scotland's first minister needs to work out, OK, where do we sit here? Uh, and if you're an SNP first minister, you need to add on to that a convincing plan to move towards independence as well in the context of a Brexit Britain that does have few cards to play. So, you know, David Lammy, I thought, gave an excellent speech a few weeks back uh, at Chatham House where he correctly identified the confluence of foreign policy and domestic policy. And I think foreign policy in that sense, in that context, is something that a new First Minister is going to need to pay a lot more attention to. Now, 
at the risk of Stephen Kerr bursting a blood vessel at my saying this, it only ever sounds radical when an SNP politician says it. You go back and look at how Jack McConnell correctly and successfully established Scotland as a global player on international development. He did that because it was in our interests. He did that because it was a reflection of our values. We need to do the same thing. And I would say that if Douglas Ross was first minister or Anna Sarwar was first minister. So I think that, you know, devolution and the devolution settlement as it is, I think his his I think his is is just not fit for purpose in terms of the current geopolitical cycle and where the global headwinds are going. I think we all need to get around the table and work out how do we best use the powers we've got? How do we push the boundaries of that? What does that mean for our debate on independence? Because all of these things are material to the success of Scotland's economy, the prosperity of its people, the well-being of its people. And as I say, that is the only show in town right now. So there's a lot of people who've got uh, a stake in that. They need to have a place at the table. And, and Joanna, we at Reform Scotland have put in quite a lot of work on education uh, and, and education reform and looking at what's working and, and what isn't. We're doing some similar work on health at the moment. How likely is it that a new First Minister is perhaps going to grab the thistle of reform. Um, you know, I would look at maybe some of the reforms that uh, happened down south and elsewhere um, on, say, education. And it's very hard to do meaningful reform without falling out with people sometimes. You can't always bring all of the teachers or the teaching unions or the health unions with you because sometimes you're doing things that politicians can push through, but, but they, you know, the, the vested interests don't necessarily want their conditions changed overly. The concern, I suppose, has been that because independence, as Stuart says, is there as one of the big things for a, an SNP first minister, you don't want to fall out with these people because you're going to need their support for independence. And it seems sometimes there's a, a clash between the two imperatives. What's your take on that? Well, I mean, just I'm going to answer that question, but I just want to say about the economy. Yes, of course, the economy must be central. And I think we have to have a, a plan for sustainable growth. And we're in a coalition agreement with a political party that doesn't believe in growth. So I think that's a bit problematic. And the Greens have been issuing various threats that if we don't choose a leader that's to their liking on identity politics, they'll break the Butte House Agreement. Well, they don't have to break it. They can terminate it, as can we. And that should be a matter for the new leader to give some thought to. Um, again, on the economy, uh, for years now, I've been saying that we'll never win the case for independence until we answer some of the big questions that my constituents have on the economy of uh, an independent Scotland. Yes, of course, there are lots of small nations that thrive economically, but we need to explain how we get from where we are now to being one of those nations. Uh, we've got all sorts of issues we need to tackle about cross-border trade if we are intending to go back into the European Union. And, uh, and also we need to address the issue of how long uh, it will take us to get back in. There's loads of work on these issues out there, mm. but one of the problems with the SNP, and, and this touches on issues like education as well, that we've largely, for years now, had no really meaningful debates at our conference. Conference motions have largely, not always, but largely been rubber stamping of motherhood and apple pie motions, or politics as group therapy, when people come and talk about their pain and how they came into politics to solve their own pain. Politicians shouldn't come into politics to solve their own identity or pain issues. They should be there to serve, solve the, ident the issues of their, that matter to their constituents and uh, their country. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't like to have to be the education um, minister or cab sec right now. And, you know, there are advantages to not being in Holyrood. <laughs> That's one of them. Um, but, yeah, you know, the party needs to, we need a massive reset on policy. You know, Nicola promised that she she said she wanted to be judged on closing the attainment gap, and she's failed to do that. Now, I'm not saying it's easy, but there are all sorts of issues in, in education at the moment, and some of them are maybe a bit difficult to tackle. Uh, Michael Mara asked a very reasonable question, I thought, at FMQs a few weeks ago about the position in my alma mater, where all the all, all the positions for Scottish law students in Edinburgh Law School, as I understand it now, are given to students from certain postcodes so that people who have the actual entry requirements are not getting into the law school. Now, I'm all for helping more people to get into university, 
but not at the cost of other people who've done the work. I mean, it's just, just insane. And he was slapped down for asking that question as though he was questioning uh, measures to improve access to university. He wasn't. He was just questioning an unintended outcome. And this happens again and again with SNP policies. So, yeah, our party needs to do some huge work on policy. And education is perhaps one of the most pressing ones. If we don't get that right, then we're going to have a massive problem in the future. And, and that maybe takes us to, uh, we haven't really talked about independence in terms of the strategy uh, ahead. It's been touched on, but we, we can't not talk about it mm. given the party that we're, we're, we're talking about here. Um, you know, and it's been my view, for what it's worth, that in a sense that Salmon Sturgeon 20-year, 30-year project um, wasn't really about using Holyrood to its max in terms of the powers that it does have to put Scotland in a position where it had one of the best education systems in Europe or the world. It had, you know, a reformed health system, difficult though that is, that could hit 2040, its 100th anniversary, still free at the point of use, but, you know, uh, operating in a way that, that, that made uh, its users uh, content with what it was. Um, and so I wonder, going forward then, whether you think that that salmon sturgeon put, if you like, has run its course in terms of its approach to winning independence, to you know fighting with Westminster, always be a bit of that, but but the antagonism has been difficult. The whinging word is often used; you probably wouldn't use it. Um, uh, and and then also uh, you know this constant sort of badgering Scots by Nicola Sturgeon as, as it's felt for the last couple of years that we need to go now, we need to go now. Almost since Brexit, we need we're going to do it sometime between twenty eighteen and early twenty nineteen. We're going to do it on October the nineteenth this year. Uh, we're going to do it at the next general election, or we'll do it at Holyrood after that. And it's there is a sense of, could you give us a minute, yeah. maybe from aspects of the electorate? Could yeah. we have a pathway, for example, mm. that says, you know, now it might be, we'll get to 60% by being brilliant at government. And that's how we'll get you to trust us. And then perhaps if we can persuade people to go to independent uh, to be, take the step to independence at that point, because you can see how well we've done and imagine mm. how much better we could do. It's almost felt, just everything you said, Joanna, was pointing to this, that, OK, we haven't made a great job of devolution, but let's jump to independence because that will be brilliant. And that's quite a hard argument to sell. The to two people, should be linked. The two should yes. be linked. Yes. You see, I, I don't buy, I don't buy that Salmond and Sturgeon are on the same page. You know, Alex's motto was team record vision. That's how we went into 2011 election. And that's how we went into the referendum. Mm -hmm. Whatever you call Nicola Sturgeon's government, it wasn't a team effort. Uh, and our record at the moment's not great, and we've lost our vision. Um, I want to correct something that was said earlier. Ash Regan has not said that she supports a de facto referendum, and Ash will be setting out her stall at the end of the week. But I think what she has said is that independence should always be front and central in an SNP manifesto, and I agree with that. But I don't support a de facto referendum at the next Westminster election. The next Winston Westminster election is going to be about whether or not people want a Labour government. And the SNP needs to wake up to the fact that we're going to lose seats if we don't uh, get our act together, because people are going to look at our, a lot of our supporters are natural Labour voters, they're going to look at our failure to deliver independence and our failure to have any meaningful plans for it or vision, and they're going to say, yeah, I'd much rather have a Labour government for the next five years, thank you very much, as I'll probably be, be me and my family will be better off under that. Um, so I think we should be discussing uh, I don't really like the phrase de facto referendums, but I should think we should be discussing alternative routes to independence if we can't get a, a Section 30 order. But the bottom line is that unless you bring British government to the negotiating table and reach agreement, it's not going to be recognised internationally. And it's the responsibility of politicians like me and Stuart to tell people, like, people that whether they want to hear it or not. Now, I'm laughing at some of the stuff in the chat and I just want to answer questions there. Why am I not running for leader? not running for leader because I'm not a member of the Holyrood Parliament. It would be impossible for me to step into the First Minister's shoes uh, and particularly on the truncated timetable. And so it's just out of the question. And uh, that's why I've chosen who I consider to be the best of the potential candidates and be putting my support behind them, securing the knowledge that what Ash wants to run is a team and a collegiate approach, which we very badly need to get back to. We're nearly out of time, but sure. Um... Alistair Jack, I think, explicitly said to get to 60% for a consistent period and then we can talk about a referendum. Is that a fair comment? No, 
Um, so I set out my views on all of this in a paper a couple of weeks ago, which people can find on my website if they care to go and read it. Um, I don't want to put a number on it uh, because I, 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 I think one of the problems we've had over the years is being overly prescriptive and boxing ourselves into corners. We need to get away from that. But I do agree that we need to build majority sustained support for independence. That, in my view, is the reason we are continually being dismissed. Now, we know from public polling that two thirds of the electorate believe a referendum should take place. They believe a referendum, a mandate for a referendum has been given by the electorate. Now that's not all independent supporters who think that. So our, our opponents here in the Westminster government are the ones being unreasonable. Our position is quite a strong position. And I think any action we take should only be about reinforcing that strong position, not allowing for public opinion to tilt away from us. And I worry that if you go down that route of a de facto referendum or declaring an election victory to be something that it plainly is not, the constitutional function of a general election is to elect a parliament from which King Charles will invite the leader of the largest party to form a government. But that doesn't prevent us from putting independence and the right to choose front and center of that campaign. And I think, you know, I go back to the points I made around how we actually move the dial on this. Good government, inspiring a view amongst the public that the Scottish government has your back, that it has Scotland's interests at heart all of the time, even when it might not do things that you, or might do things that you don't like. And we know from the Scottish Attitude Survey that on a basic issue of confidence, the government in Edinburgh always outstrips the government in Westminster at every turn. Again, that is not all independent supporters. So if you can do that, deliver good quality public services that people can rely on, combined with making a case that's based on economic fairness. I think one of the, one of the problems we've had over the years is we thought that the democracy arguments would get us over the line. And the democracy arguments are really important. You know, Brexit offends everything about the Scottish democratic expression. Uh, you know, I am offended by the, the Section 35 reach, for example. But that ain't going to do it. It ain't going to cut it. So whilst these arguments are important and we should make them, economic fairness, a sense that we can take Scotland into line with our Western European counterparts, end this, this kind of tinkering around the edges in how we manage our economy and actually go for some serious structural changes, get Scotland back into the European Union and on the front foot with a government that's got its mojo back and it's lost its mojo recently, it's fair to say. I think that's how you move the dial uh, on independence. And we should only ever commit to a process that is legal, democratic and fair, because fundamentally, I need no voters to feel that they've had a fair kick of the ball if they're going to accept the result at the other end. I don't want 50% plus one. I'm not going to put a number on it, but I want a win that everybody feels they've had a fair say in. And anything, I mean, I I, I take Joanna's point about, you know, we've laboured the, the, the gold standard being a referendum. I think that's the right thing to do. It should be a referendum. I'm comfortable with that being an argument but it's our opponents who are being unreasonable here. And when you look at that two thirds majority who believe that there should be a referendum, there are, there, they often believe it should just be in the middle distance. No matter when you ask the question, it tends to be they think it should be about five years away. So we will have to move on that at some point, but we're in a strong position. Let's craft the case and get away from this debate on process. Okay, well, that, that sort of brings us to the end. I'll just say that in terms of moving to good or better governance, Reform Scotland stands ready to help. We've got a whole bunch of stuff that we're ready to sit down and, and, and share with you, and, and some of it's already even in government uh, legislation. Um, but it's early days in the leadership contest. It may be late days for uh, Kate, but we'll see. Um, there's a lot still to be talked about. We didn't get through everything today, but there's just so much to talk about. The future of the nation tends to be like that. I'd just like to say again, thank you to Stuart and Joanna. It was really, really interesting. And uh, we are very grateful that you gave us uh, your time. Maybe we could do this again once we have a first minister um, and you can uh, put your points across again so that they'll be listening to you. Um, but thank you for taking your time. And thanks to everyone for turning up. That was a great turnout today. Uh, and we'll probably do more uh, before the end of this leadership contest, I think. Because Excellent. Thanks very, thanks very much. Thanks very much. Great. All right. Thanks again, people. Cheers, folks. Bye. Bye. Thank you.